Welcome everyone. My name is Diogo Marquez. I'm your friend in sales. Today's guest is Evan Carmichael. Evan, welcome to the show. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your present focus. I'll go overview quickly. And then if you want to dive deep on something, let me know. I had my first business when I was 19. I had a bunch of other companies, minor companies kind of growing up, but nothing really significant. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a banker. I thought I wanted to be an investment banker. Uh, had opportunities to join Merrill Lynch uh, and turned it down to go start my own business. And really glad I did that. Uh, I built it, sold it, had a, a whole bunch of difficulties in doing that, which we can dive into if you want. Uh, from there, I joined a venture capital firm. We were raising half a million to 15 million for companies who wanted to grow and expand. And then from there, started this business, basically what I'm doing now, helping out entrepreneurs in believe in themselves more. I, I write books, I speak, I have a website, I have a popular YouTube channel, and I was trying to make the path a little bit easier for entrepreneurs to uh, achieve their goals because my path was pretty rough to get it started. When you look at the distribution curve, most businesses fail. That said, and knowing that, what was the underlying principle that got you to create your channel? People fail because they just don't give it enough time. I think first off, a lot of entrepreneurs get started for the wrong reason. So you have to do something because you have a desire to actually do the work. I think people are just chasing opportunities too often. And as soon as it gets hard, as soon as you get hit that first punch to the rib, you're going you're gonna to bow out because it's too difficult, where you have to actually enjoy the work that you're doing to have success in any field. Because if you go up against any competition and they love their work and you don't, you're going to get destroyed. You just have no shot beating somebody who loves what they're doing. So you have to find that thing. Then once you do, it's a matter of just being consistent every single day, taking some action. It's, it's the boring work of actually doing it every single day. I look at my YouTube channel. I posted something a little over four years ago, like a four years and two weeks ago saying, uh, I just hit a million views on YouTube and I was so proud. I hit a million views. I had 7,000 subscribers, a million views. I was, I was celebrating. And four years later, I'm at 170 million views. I'm at 1.1 million subscribers from 7,000. Why? Well, I put, you know, two to three videos every single day for four years, right? Like you put in the work, you do it every single day. And I think entrepreneurs just give up too soon. Uh, they stop after two months, three months, four months, and, and aren't willing to, they don't see the immediate results. And so they quit. Uh, and that's why there's such a high failure rate. Those two things. One, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing because they don't love it. And two, they just give up too soon. Do you think the people you are referring to have a moment of insanity, just like Gerber talked about in the E-Myth book? Yeah. So my perspective on that is I think, I think you need to do the thing that you love doing and that there's a market for. It has to be both. If you are just chasing opportunity and you don't love the work, you're going to get crushed by the people who love the work. And if you just do something you love and there's no market for it, you've got a hobby, which is great and fills the soul, but it's not a business that you're going to turn something around. So it always has to be both what you love doing with what there is a genuine demand for. Run us through some of the challenges that you faced when running your first businesses. I think entrepreneurs listening to this will take more value from your experiences. The biggest challenge I faced with my first business, you know, I turned down opportunities. I'm 19 years old. I turned down opportunities to go work at Merrill Lynch and McKinsey and, you know, six figure salary out of the gate and all these, you know, what I thought I wanted to do to go own a piece of a startup, you know, be a 30% owner, uh, have a $300 a month salary uh, to, to try this new business. And one, I thought it would be easier than it was. I think, you know, entrepreneurship, I'm, I'm, how old am I? What year is it? I am 38 in May and 20 years ago, it wasn't as prevalent to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't talked about being an entrepreneur. And so I thought it would be hard ish, but I knew that whatever I put my attention on, I could solve and get better at. And here I was putting in a ton of work and not getting any results. I didn't understand why we were just sucking so badly because uh, I put a ton of effort into it. And then I ended up telling my business partner that I quit on him. And uh, that was, you know, probably the worst day of my life and decided the next day I can't quit on this. It's important to me. I have to keep going. I think, I think 
it's something that's not talked about a lot in entrepreneur circles, how often, how hard it really is and how often we think about quitting at times, especially in the early days where you question, like, maybe I should just go get a job, you know, like, who do you have that conversation with? And I was too uh, embarrassed and ashamed to tell my friends about it when they were asking me to go to a birthday party or go have drinks. And, you know, that 20 bucks that I couldn't afford it. Like I had to pick one thing per month that I can go out and do. And I was too embarrassed to tell them. I just said, I'm, I'm super busy. I'm, I'm living the entrepreneur life, you know, and all the good stuff. And not, no, like I make $300 a month and I can't afford that $20 to go have pizza and beer with you. Uh, so I think the, that the emotional part was the hardest of everything. And it's, it's all, you know, it's all my fault. I could have reached out. I could have had more support if I wanted to. Um, it was a lack of education around what it really takes to be an entrepreneur. And then the lack of uh, me being able to reach out and get the support that I needed. People that say they want to be entrepreneurs is a bit like saying they want to be a fish. It's either you're like either a fish or you're not a fish. What do you think? Yeah, my take on that is I think, I think for people who don't know what they want to do, I think you need to explore. I think everybody should try being an entrepreneur. I think everybody should try having a YouTube channel. I think everybody should try salsa dancing. I think people don't try enough stuff. I think, you know, the, the greatest basketball player in the world is not Michael Jordan. The greatest basketball player in the world is a manager at Starbucks because he never picked up a basketball. You know, I think people don't try enough. And so uh, whether that means you continue on being an entrepreneur, continue on being a YouTuber or an investor or anything else, I think it's worth trying so that you, you know and you get a sense. And the sooner you can do that in life, the better. Uh, and so uh, I'm okay with people trying to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't mean you're going to win. Uh, you know, you, you have to do a ton of work to make it happen. But I'd much rather you try on a small scale and fail at it and go back and get a job and having, having tasted it to know what it's like, then sit there for the next 30 years regretting the fact that you never took your shot. I'm a vacuum cleaner for books. But that said, it's important for people to realize that most books out there are skim surface type. When you start to get really deep on a specific topic, you find that there's not that much information out there regarding that specific topic. You'll see that there's a lot of shtick going from point A to point B. What are your thoughts, Evan? Yeah, I think... I think it's great that there are more sources of information now. It's what I try to do in the videos that I put up, but there's so many, there's podcasts, there's YouTube videos, there's, there's great books. There's a lot of content out there. Uh, it's never been easier to find somebody's story. I think people, uh, they underestimate the game. They underestimate how hard it's going to be. But then when you look at the people who've had the most success, whoever it is that you look up to as a hero or entrepreneur visionary or somebody who you, you know, aspire to be like, chances are they started with less than what you already have right now. And it was a really long, hard road to get to where they're at. And I encourage people to model success. It's what saved my business. It was modeling Microsoft. Like Bill Gates saved my company, even though I've never met him. But by modeling his strategies and just the motivation, that allowed me to keep going in my company. So I encourage your listeners to whoever it is that you look up to, research their story. There's never been more information, whether you're a vacuum cleaner for books or videos or whatever it is, their story is available. Look at how they started. It's, it, they have less than what you have right now. And if they could do it, then you can too. It's just going to require a lot of hard work to get there. Jim Rogers once told me, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think your channel brings a ton of value to people because they can see where some of their stories rhyme with yours. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, and with what you're doing on your channel too, right? Like doing these interviews and trying to learn and dissect people's stories. I encourage people to one, look at people who, who are in their industry and who they really like. The thing that saved my company was when I was 19, I asked myself, I'm not the first guy to try to sell software before. Like somebody has figured this out. I, I feel like I've tried everything. It's not working. Somebody has figured this out. And that was the light bulb moment to say, hey, okay, who else has done this? And in researching Bill Gates' stories by reading books at that time, uh, you know, I got the strategy to, to win. So I think, I think everybody listening should go and research the top five people in their industry related. Like I sold biotech software. There was no big biotech software company I could model, but software is close enough. So I modeled Microsoft. So find the five biggest people in your industry or related industry and go learn from them. And 
find the people who you just respect. Like if you love Steve Jobs, but you sell shoes, like you can learn from Steve Jobs and apply it to shoes, sure. right? The more connected you are to that entrepreneur, the more their lessons, you know, it rhymes, right? With your industry, uh, you can definitely learn from them and apply it to your business. And the more you're surrounding yourself with visionary thinkers, big thinking people, people who kind of challenge you to do more than what you're doing, then the more you're actually going to rise up and take a bigger game. I always wanted to be around people. They, are, they were great at doing what they're doing. You learn from them. What have you learned from people that you studied and interviewed? Yeah, so I've done almost 6,000 videos now on my YouTube channel. Not all of them are public. Probably about 1,000 of them are not public. Uh, it's just how much we throw away. And I've learned something from everybody that, that, I've, that I've profiled. Otherwise, I don't put the content up. I think ultimately... <laughs> I learned the most from my parents. They're on the wall behind me. Those are my parents. And that's me when I'm like eight years old. And they, they taught me just life lessons and, and how to be a human being and values. And then everybody else, I've learned different lessons from that, uh, that I've applied to my company in different ways. Even the people behind me. So like Steve Jobs was more the, the visionary, have a big dream, want to make an impact on the world, right? Do I want to learn how to be a parent like him? Probably not, but I can learn some visionary thinking from him. Howard Schultz started Starbucks and he's there because he was the first guy that I saw apply his values in a corporate setting. So there was a, there was a shareholders event and one of his investors stood up and said, Hey, why are you supporting gay marriage at the time when like nobody was supporting gay marriage? And he's like, the lens through which we see the world is through equality. And if you're not happy with the returns on investments you're getting, then sell Starbucks and go buy something else. It's like, when does a CEO, say that right Agreed. maybe an entrepreneur but like of a public company when does that happen it doesn't happen sure. um ap janini is the founder of bank of america and he bet on the little guy he he lent money to entrepreneurs when there was an earthquake he took two barrels and a plank of wood and he set up shop at his bank and he lent money to people based off of a handshake and a look in their eye if you can imagine like a banker hey like trust me handshake and look in their eye that's how you make a decision he gave money to Walt Disney when everybody thought Walt Disney was crazy. And you're going to do a cartoon that's a full length movie. Like that's never going to work. He's the one who bet on him and uh, Kanye on the wall there uh, in that clip, this video clip of him talking to radio station, more just talking about like the time is now. I don't want to sit inside of a corporation for the next 30 years. The time is now be the greatest you. And so you know, those are four examples. And plus my parents being fifth, but everybody that I've, I've put on my channel, I've learned something from. And I love being able to pull from different people. And I, I love running. A, I see myself running a race alongside them. I think the worst thing you can do is run a race against three-year-olds. Like that's how most people run their life. They want to win, but they, they play such a small game. They're running against three-year-olds. Where if you're running against people who are faster than you and better than you, it, you may not beat them, but you're going to be a lot better than you were when you're running against three-year-olds. Jeff Bezos talks a lot about this. Long-term views, decisions. Knowing what you are, where you want to be in 50 years makes you look at what you're doing presently and start doing things differently. Yeah, Jeff Bezos has a great model that he calls the regret minimization framework. Yeah, and so the basic idea is you fast forward your life till age 90 or by that time, maybe we're living to 300 and look back on your life. It's like, well, I regret not having made this decision. And it's and as what he likes to say, too, is it's rarely the things that we do that that we regret. It's the things that we don't do that we end up regretting. And so to try to live your life with as few of those regrets as possible, I think it's super helpful uh, because whatever you want to do that you're afraid of, it comes with that. It's a huge dose of fear. You're, like, you're afraid to do it. And so what gets you through, what I like doing is make the future fear of regret so big. You compound 50 years of regret of not doing it versus this short term, like one day of actually launching it. Uh, and that applies to personal situations as much as it does business. So you want to ask that girl out, you know, just ask her out. You're afraid of rejection. Great. But what happens if that could have, like, I'll think in my head, that could have been my wife. You know, I, I could have, right. Just make this huge story up. And so like, now I have to have that conversation. And so whenever you're afraid to do something, I just make the future fear of regret so much more painful, that then I have to go and take action. A couple of years back, I met Alexandre Soares dos Santos, which was the wealthiest person in Portugal. He was just sitting on a park bench. I went there, 
I presented myself and we started talking. We had this wonderful conversation. I learned a ton and I still bring that day to today to my, my own experience. I wouldn't have uh, this wonderful thought of having that conversation with that person unless I actually went there. And I think people don't do this enough. You did this really emotional video about Chris Gardner. What made you do it? You know, people aren't familiar with him. He's probably best known as the pursuit of happiness. If you've seen the movie, Will Smith and his son were in that movie. He went from being basically homeless, living in, sleeping in washrooms uh, with his son, single dad, trying to make his business go to becoming a stockbroker, eventually, you know, building up his career and, and now being uh, an entrepreneur, being wealthy. And, uh, you know, my one word is believe. I love the story of, of perseverance and believing in yourself. And I think, I think people often forget the path that a lot of people took to get to where they're at. It's easy to look at a Chris Gardner now and he has his own brokerage firm and he's super successful. And it's easy to see him as some special person that you can never be. Right. And, and all these people, all the people that you look up to, it's easy to see like, wow, like I can never be like Steve Jobs. Look at how crazy, you know, advanced he is or Elon Musk, whoever the person is. But looking at Chris Gardner, like he was homeless. He lived in bathrooms. Right. And so like when I, when I do those pieces, it just puts up a mirror for myself and people watching too. Like what, what's your excuse? Like, what's my excuse? Why can't I do that? If he could do that, what, whatever excuse I have is really just an excuse. And so I love, I love being able to um, showcase some of those stories because again, like they started with less than what I have now. I don't have a reason why I can't go off and do the same thing. Well, back I did an interview with billionaire Hard Marx, and I've learned something that is really powerful, which is to bring the uncertainty factor in your decision making process. People usually are very like skim to the surface when addressing what's actually required in order to succeed. People say something like do, do A plus B plus C and equals success. But in reality, you should have a probability factor of you attaining that specific step in relationship to your current resources. A good example would be A times X percent of you achieving that step plus B times Y, the percentage of you achieving that step and so on and so on. So when people are doing something, it's important that instead of just motivation, understanding that what you are doing is actually effective. You want to achieve something. What's the plan? What are the results that you are getting? Are these results in line with what you want in your life? At any point in time, this is what you need to address when you're doing your, your process in order to achieve what you want. Failure versus success. Evan? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> almost nothing goes well. Like, <laughs> almost nothing. You get one hit out of, out of 100 tries. I'm serious. Like, I think part of it too, I think maybe this is part of just being an entrepreneur is you at least for me, I, I lock out the bad things. If you just focus on all the things that didn't work out, you'd be depressed. Most of the videos that I try don't work. I don't even remember all the series that we've tried. We've tried and failed at more videos than most people ever put out in their life. And so I just pay attention to what's working and then go with those. I think, I think, I mean, by studying success, I think you'll see that over and over and over and over and over again. It was a whole bunch of failures and for most people, they fail once and then that's it. They quit and they're out. Where for all of the people that you look up to and respect, they failed multiple times. And then that's what led to them eventually discovering the thing that helped them explode. So if you look at my video series and say, the top 10 rules of success is a big win. And that became a book, right? So that, that's a big win for my channel. That started off as one test video that then people liked and said, hey, we want more of it. Great. At that time, I had tons of other videos that I was putting up on my channel that did not work, that did not go anywhere. And that's where, again, you're combining what you love with what the market wants. I love every single, I wouldn't put out a video if I didn't love it. But it doesn't mean that my audience is going to love it. It doesn't mean there's a demand for it. Just because I love it doesn't mean that anybody else is going to love it. And so it has to be that mix of both. But that idea of just you expect to fail. I expect to fail and I ultimately expect to win. But to expect it hit a thousand, to expect that everything you try is going to win, it's not. 
and it's also a constant evolution in terms of my interviews. As an example, I've done tons of interviews. Uh, I'm a lot better now than I was before and I'll be a lot better in five years than I am now. Sure. Right. And so it's like, it's always, if you look at your show, like I'm sure your first interview was way worse. And <laughs> now you're probably super nervous and didn't know what to do in the intro and whatever. And then if you keep going in five years, you're going to look back on this and say, wow, I was still just getting started. And so I think that becomes a problem because you know what looks good. You know what a good interviewer looks like. You know what a good video looks like. You know what a good entrepreneur product looks like, but you can't create it yet because you haven't put in the work to get there. And so that's what forces a lot of people to quit. You know, you know what a good snowboarder looks like, but you get on the hill and you can't do that. And so you fall a thousand times down the hill and then you never come back. And I think that's what a lot of people do in business. Uh, it's having the patience to understand that you will, you will suck for the beginning part because you don't know what you're doing yet. And that's okay. Like, don't beat yourself down. Expect it. Expect to fail at almost everything you try at the beginning. Just like everything else that you ever learned ever in your life, you failed at the beginning. And then with practice and repetition and desire, you get better. Regarding social media growth, getting a channel from a couple of views to millions of views, organic versus paid. Evan, share some of your thoughts since you have this enormous channel. Everything I do is organic. I didn't grow anything through paid sponsorships or me like spending buying views or anything. I think ultimately comes down to, are you creating good stuff? If you are creating good stuff, it's never been easier for people to share it. Like would somebody watch your video or read your posts on Instagram and share it? If they won't, then it's not good enough. You haven't done a good enough job. I'm also a big believer that the quantity leads to the quality, that the more you do it, the better you're going to get at doing it. So I'm just starting on Instagram. This is a great case that anybody wants to like witness this happening. Come follow me on Instagram. I have 7,000 followers on Instagram. 7,000 is nothing. It took me six years or so to get to 6,000 followers and a month to get to 7,000 followers. And I'm not promoting it everywhere. I'm not sharing it all over my YouTube channel. I'm not putting my newsletter. It's, it's organic reach. And as I make better stuff, I'm learning it. I'm making tons of mistakes. Almost every day or two days, I'm making a major tweak because we're still at the beginning. And I tell, like, I tried this. Okay, I'm throwing that entire strategy away. Now we're trying this. And constant reiteration. And I'm going to win on Instagram because I'm going to make three posts a day. That's going to keep getting better and better and better for the next five years. And I'm going to win. Like that's how you win. And so you don't need to put paid behind it. The problem for most people is they think their stuff is good, but it's not. You think your content is you're good. Your interview, your Instagram post is good, but it's actually not that good. So get better improve. If somebody sees it and doesn't share it or tag somebody or send it to a friend, then it wasn't good enough and you need to improve the quality. But how do you test it? This is where the Howard Marks effect kicks in, the uncertainty factor. So it's just knowing the nuances of the, the game that you're in. So when I wrote my book, both books as an example, I printed off 30 copies and gave it to a test audience. I posted to my Facebook, say, hey, who wants to read a copy of my book and give me feedback? And I chose half that were entrepreneurs and half that were not entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs will resonate with it way stronger. Sure, sure. Is what I'm all about. But then I took their feedback. And from there, for your one word, I cut half the book. I wrote two books worth of content and cut it down to half the book based off of feedback. I loved every word in that book. I love everything I make. Like, I will not give it to you if I don't love it. I loved it. And it's emotional. It's like, you're, you don't like that? Great. But it's like, the market has spoken. Nobody likes this. If 30 people read that page and nobody underlines a single word on it, I suck. Like that page sucks. It doesn't deserve to continue on and be in the book. Same thing for the top 10 rules. I gave it to, I gave it to 30 people. Initially, it was 50 people that I profiled. We cut 10 out of the book. The 10 that didn't perform with the test audience are out. So YouTube. You know, people aren't watching your videos. You compare one video to another. Instagram is even easier. You have hashtags. You, you rank for the hashtags that you're trying to go for. You see if it, is it showing up. Are people liking it? Are people engaging with it? Are people tagging their friends on the picture? So just knowing the nuances, a little bit of each, of each um, platform that you're trying to sell through. And then testing, 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 testing. I'm, I'm looking at my, because I'm so into my Instagram right now. I'm looking at my Instagram multiple times per day. 
I don't need an analytics program to tell me which, which picture is doing well and what style is going. Like, I know because I'm in it. I'm living it. I'm, I'm breathing it, breathing. right? Yeah. I feel it. And so I'm coming up with ideas. I'm getting inspired by what other people are doing as well as what I would like to see. And then I test it. Constant iteration. Like writing a book is a long process. So that may not be your, your best first test because if it takes you six months or a year to write it and then it flops, that may not be fantastic. But making YouTube videos, making Instagram posts, Twitter, Pinterest, Snapchat, any of these platforms, the testing cycle is so fast. People just put up one thing, 10 things, it doesn't work and they quit. It's, it's just not the game to play. Uh, you have to recognize that a platform like Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is, long term, you will win if you are consistent and you're making good content. And so you just have to figure out what the consistency you can control. You just get up and you work. The good content, you have to get better at. You have to pay attention to what's happening. You have to listen to your audience. You have to listen to your heart and make something better. But that's how I'm going to win. I'm going to make three posts per day for four to five years, and then I'm going to win. It's how I won on YouTube. It's how I'm going to win on Instagram. It's how you can win in any business. Just people aren't creating enough output. They start and stop and start and stop and start and stop. Like I tried that for two months and it didn't work. Two months, you barely tried it. Like you suck in those two months. You put out a bunch of crap and nothing worked. Like surprise, right? Like you have to keep going. And maybe you look at my Instagram channel and, and you think that it sucks. Great. Tell me that it sucks and tell me how to make it better and I'll improve it. And all of these skills, when you learn it in one, you can apply it to the others. Like my Instagram game, Instagram is so easy compared to YouTube. Three posts on Instagram a day is easy compared to making three 10 minute plus videos on YouTube a day, right? It's crazy. And then the learning how to hack a YouTube algorithm, you take those same skills and apply it to hacking the Instagram algorithm. It's not that, it's not that different. And so maybe in five years, Instagram is dead. And you say, well, I spent all this time investing in Instagram. It doesn't matter. Like I can jump into something else. I take those skills and apply it because the sharing of content, the sharing of information will continue forever and ever and ever. Like this will be VR at some point. We'll be on our contact lenses and we'll be shaking hands, you know, in the room. And all the skills that I'm learning now will be transferable to that. So just because you tried it in this platform, you think, oh, it's going to disappear. Great. YouTube will disappear. I expect it to disappear. But everything that I learn and build in it will be applied in another mechanism. From studying all these successful people, run us through some of your favorite ones and the most common denominator that you found. That's what this book is all about. We go through all the most common lessons. But I would say, uh, one, everybody has an idea, but that's not uncommon. Like everybody listening has an idea. We all have ideas. The first step was they did something about it. Like they actually took action on it. So many people have great ideas and they sit on their couch and they never do anything about it or they wait for an investor to come and now they're going to do something. Like no investor wants to fund your idea. You got to get out and do something. Give me some momentum, right? Go to an investor with just a business plan and, and no actual momentum. You're dead in the water. They don't want to touch you. So a lot of people are, are waiting for something else to happen. It never happens. And then they get upset because somebody else made millions of dollars off of their idea, right? That person got rich off of my idea. No, it was their idea. You just didn't take any action ever. So like successful people, they get started and they expect it to not work and to fail and go through all the crappy iterations at the beginning. Um, and then the third thing I would say is they, they, they just keep going. They just keep going. They're, they're, they're just more consistent than everybody else. They follow through every single day. They deal with the hurdles, the obstacles, all the crap that comes with building the business. And they just follow through because it's often not the smartest people, the most capable people. It's just the people who actually took some kind of action, got out of their own way and just followed through every single day to make it happen. It's boring stuff, dude. This is boring stuff. But people are looking for the pill, right? Like sign up for this course and now you're going you're gonna to be amazing. No, it's boring. You just got to get up every day and do the work for five years and then you'll be successful. Regarding your own books, tell me about them. So I wrote two books. Uh, the first one is called Your One Word. That's about finding your most important core value and then being able to run that through your life and your business so that you stop living other people's version of your life and start living your own. Uh, I think a lot of people feel like they have more to be able to give and do. Not that their life sucks, just they feel there's another gear, but they don't know how to access it. So that's what this book is all about. The second one is the top 10 rules of success where I took the 40 
of the most popular videos on my channel, the top tens, and then condense them down to two rules per page. And my goal there is I don't want you to read the book all the way through. I want you to read one page a day so that you wake up, you read one page. Everybody has time to read one page, like two minutes. And you've just been presented with two genius ideas from Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey, whoever it is, and then apply that somehow to your life. If you woke up every day and surrounded yourself with success minded people for two minutes, you did that every single day, it'll make a dramatic impact on your life. And so those are the two books. Raising capital and entrepreneurial ideas. Where do you see a good marriage there? I think the most important thing for people who are listening is the best ideas, the ones that take off, the ones that get funded are the ones that solve a real problem. And so if you are looking at your life, your, the business you want to create, the businesses that are around you, does your thing solve a real problem? Does it, does it create some kind of utility? Like does using your software or using your technology, first off, you're trying to get raising capital, especially from a VC or angel, you, you're, they want high growth. They want to make money back. So if you're, you know, if you want to start a car dealership, like that's not the thing to go and raise capital for. They want to see high growth. So it's usually tech related somehow. They want to get their margins out. Uh, and so does your, does your thing actually solve a real problem? And it starts with your own experience, your day-to-day -day life, if it's a consumer version, or the businesses that you're dealing with. Does your thing actually help? Here's a massive problem that people are facing, and here's how we solve it. If your thing actually solves a problem, then you need to go out and, and build something around it. It's never been easier to prototype and to build. Like Just going to any investor with a plan and no prototype, you're dead. Like Unless you have a ton of background in that field and you've had three successful exits or something like that, you're dead. Nobody wants to see a, 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 just an idea. You have to prototype. You have to get customers. You have to get ideally somebody paying you a little bit. But if you don't have money coming in, at least you have momentum, you have customers, you have some kind of traction. Uh, Cause I think a lot of people just start off, they go too soon. They, they expect the investor to save them. Uh, their business plan gets rejected. You spend your whole time raising capital instead of actually building the business. Like raising capital becomes an almost full-time job if you're doing it right. And so that means you're not spending time building your business. And so understand that the best kind of capital to raise is expansion capital. Like you've proven that it works in a small market, small test, case study, and now you want to expand it out. And I need the capital to help me do it. Where if you're raising capital for R&D, like forget it. You're raising capital just to get started or to hire somebody to prove a concept. It's not going to happen. Like you, you'd have to have a really stupid investor come on board and you don't want that investor. Sure. You don't want, you don't want that stupid investor who's going to fund your R and D, you know, cause now you're stuck with a stupid investor for the rest of this business life cycle. Right. And no investor wants to buy out another investor. Your next round, your angel, your VC doesn't want to buy out the stupid investor who put money in the first place. They want to see that the money's going in to grow the business. Um, and so always make it around problems that you are seeing in the market. And so we'll continue to have ebbs and flows in different markets, whether it's, VR that's coming and you know all the different things that are coming out uh, if you see a real problem uh, and you have the passion to go and solve that problem there are, there will be money and opportunity for you I have found that solving your own problem the thing that frustrates you the most in reality if you find a solution you are actually solving a bunch of people's problems because you don't know if they're actually suffering from the same thing would you agree it's what I did with my channel with my YouTube channel, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be around successful entrepreneurs, bigger thinking. I wanted people to challenge me to push harder and do more. And it's why I still learn from every video. If I don't learn, I don't post it. So it's selfish for me. I'm, I'm scratching my own itch and then I share it with the world. And luckily there's enough people who believe the same thing too. Like what you're doing here, hopefully you bring on guests where you are learning something. You're asking questions that you are interested in. You're learning in the process and you get to share it with everybody else. Right. And so I think it's a, it's a great place to start. A lot of the most successful businesses in the world started there. A problem that you have, go out and solve it. And then other people will pay you to solve it for them. Evan, advice to your younger self. What would you say? Believe more, believe I'm capable of more. And it's still like, it's what I would tell my 20 year old self. And even more of a mind twist is if I'm 70 telling my 38 year old self, it'd be the same thing. Like believe that I can do more. Like why can't I be doing this at a bigger scale? Why can't I be acquiring companies and playing a bigger game? Um, I had a chat with, my, with a friend of mine 
and we're talking about my YouTube channel and I said kind of next steps where I want to go. I want to be able to make a video with a Steven Spielberg or Quentin Tarantino, like somebody of that ilk. And he says, well, why can't you? Like, I, I think you can. And my response was, yeah, I know you're not telling me that. I'm telling myself that I can't do that. Like it's myself telling me that I can't make a deal with Spielberg or Tarantino or somebody else. And so I think it's that constant game. I believe in myself way more than I did when I was 20 or however back into the future we're going to go, but not as much as I will when I'm 70. So then how do I close that gap? That, that's the game. And for the future, where do you see yourself going? So this is always an interesting question for me. I don't have medium term goals. I have my big vision. So, you know, I want to solve what I think is the world's biggest problem on tap human potential. I think people are doing the wrong thing for most of their lives. That Starbucks manager who should be playing basketball. Uh, so I want to help unlock that. That's never going to be solved. That, that's, that's trying to empty the ocean with a, with a spoon, right? But I wake up every day and try to do that. That's my guiding mission. Uh, apart from that, I know what I'm doing for the next couple months, right? So I'm, I'm still focusing on my YouTube channel. I'm focusing on the books. I'm focusing on my Instagram channel. I'm building my team. We're looking at content going multilingual. But where am I in five years? I have no idea. Five years ago, I had a thousand subscribers on YouTube. I said I would never write a book. You know, like all of the things that I've done, I, I would never have thought of. And so to have the, uh, I don't know, audacity or arrogance to think that I would know where I'm going to be in five years. As soon as I get a plan for where I would be in five years, I'm like, how do I make that happen now? I don't want to wait five years. I want to make it happen. And so I, I work it backwards. And so I've got my three month kind of short term thing and then my forever and not a lot in between. Regarding other books, what would be some of your recommendations? I used to read a lot more books than, than I do now. Uh, and what led to my YouTube channel kind of explosion was in trying to learn from a guy like Elon Musk, we'd have, I'd have to watch like 40 hours of video to get two to three really good nuggets. And so that's what my channel does is we condense that down to from 40 hours to, you know, 15 minutes of the best. Uh, so that would have been a lot easier question for me to handle, you know, five years ago. I think a book that really meant a lot to me in my early career was The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Um, and it's a kind of classic in the entrepreneur world. Not that you should be working four hours a week because I don't, I don't buy into that, but more just the idea of delegation, prioritizing, time management, all that stuff really kind of shaped how I run my business. Um, I finished Onward recently by Howard Schultz obviously a favorite of mine. I got his picture hanging up in my wall and I'm reading a book on habits right now. I think it's just called habits. It's decent. I don't know that I would like strongly like stamp of approval, but just kind of what I'm going through right now. I'm really, I'm very curious about habits, uh, work ethic environment, uh, as a kind of hack to how can I be better as an entrepreneur in what I'm doing. Evan, your channel is about belief at this point in your life. What would you tell your kids? to believe? If I had to say one word to my kids, uh, I mean, I would tell them to believe in themselves. That's an easy one for me, I guess, if, if you're thinking not believe. Um, you know, one of the things that my parents taught me, why they're on the wall, like belief comes from them. They would always teach me that I was Evan Castrilli Carmichael. My mom's last name is Castrilli. I'm Evan Castrilli Carmichael. I could do anything that I want. And when I didn't do well at school, when I didn't, you know, win whatever prize, you know, uh, that was always kind of ringing in the back of my head. And they were a shield for me against a lot of criticism, um, a lot of negativity. So if my teacher, you know, I remember my art teacher didn't like how I drew something and was really hard on me and my parents uh, supported me and said, well, you asked him to do this. This is, he did it. He just did it in his own style. I would always think a little differently. And so they always supported that instead of kind of repressing it. And it's something that I continue with my son. So, you know, Hayden is coming up on nine years old. And uh, every time I see him, whether it's going to bed or picking up from school, you know, the last interaction will always be Carmichael's can do, and he'll say anything. And so that's our ending, like Carmichael's can do anything. And so I'm trying to build the shield for him against any negativity any like you can't do that you're different you're strange you're weird it's like yeah you're weird it's awesome like run into the weirdness it's amazing so whether he ever becomes an entrepreneur or not that i don't care about that but more that he's doing the thing that makes him happy as opposed to just listening to teachers and like the people who are educating him and around him it's not you know i don't know that their ideals uh 
really play well to what I would like, you know, for him or what he wants for himself. Um, so yeah, Carmichael's can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, where can our listeners get a hold of you if they have any further questions? I think I'm most well known from my YouTube channel and my books. If you, if you're interested in either of them, you could go to YouTube and check me out or Amazon for the books. For me personally, I, I hang out on all the platforms, but I've talked to Instagram a lot here. So like Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter is the best place to reach me kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I make a lot of, you know, 15 second video replies for people. Uh, so to, if you're curious about me, you know, the books and the YouTube channel, are the easiest place, if you want one-on-one -on -one time, then those are the three platforms are the best. And that's it for today. Evan was a great guest. He's a great guy. Make sure you visit his channel and watch his content because he has a ton of stuff that is really high quality and will help you in your entrepreneurial endeavors. And by the way, if you like this type of content, make sure you visit byudigital.com slash book. You'll find a copy of this book there. It is a 432 page book regarding how to start a business, how to address people, how to sell door to door, all skills that are invaluable, that are critical in order for you to make wise decisions when establishing your business. If you are smart enough, you can learn from other people's mistakes. That way it will be less painful when you're developing your business because you're not having to go through all the process by yourself without knowledge. This way, this helps you in your learning curve. So I hope you enjoy this, uh, this today's podcast. Remember to subscribe, share if you like it, check out further episodes, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.